First of all, welcome on behalf of the Center for International Studies. I'm John Tierman, Executive Director, and uh, we're glad you came to this Star Forum, the first one of the year. And I encourage you to follow us on Twitter if you do things like that, or just look at our calendar every now and then to see what events we have coming up. We usually have a good dozen or so every semester. Uh, two that are coming up very soon, uh, and somewhat related to what we're doing, well, not so related, but in any case, uh, first of all, next Monday, September 21st, at five o'clock in building four, room 270. I was just telling somebody I've been here for 10 years and I still don't know where things are. So I had a hard time finding this. Uh, but in any case, uh, you know, building four, room 270 will be um, a panel on what now the Iran nuclear deal uh, that includes Scott Kemp, uh, who's in uh, uh, engineering here, I believe, uh, Lisbeth Grunland from the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, Payern uh, Mohseni of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and myself speaking about Iran and the nuclear deal. And then on October 1st, uh, we will have uh, Will McCants from the Brookings Institution, former government, State Department official, uh, speaking about his new book called The ISIS Apocalypse, The History, Strategy, and Doomsday Vision of the Islamic State. Should be a good one. This book is getting really rave reviews from people who know a lot about these things. Uh, and that should be a good one. That is going to be at 5.30, uh, also in building four, but room 370. Uh, and uh, you can find these events listed again on our website. Today, uh, we're pleased to have Ayan Hirsi Ali, who is, uh, as you know, uh, uh, a well-known, controversial, but also thoughtful critic of Islam and a promoter of women's rights. She has been, uh, since her going to the Netherlands from Kenya uh, at the age of about 20, 22, I believe, um, she became an activist in the Netherlands, uh, pointing out, in her view, the repressive features and the, uh, the violent tendencies of Islam. Uh, and of course, it has earned her a certain controversial reputation. She came to the United States several years later, was a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, and now is a senior fellow at, uh, or a fellow at the Kennedy School of Government. Um, she has most recently written a book called Heretic. Um, the which is uh, which we have for sale here, Why Islam Needs a Reformation Now. So please, we will what we will do, the format will be that she'll speak for about 20 minutes or so. Then she and I will be in conversation for about 20 minutes. And then uh, we'll open it up. We'll have plenty of time for audience participation in the form of questions, I hope. And we have two microphones uh, for you to come to speak into, because this is being video recorded. And we want to make sure that we capture uh, your question. OK? So without further ado, please help me welcome Ayan Hirsi Ali. Thank you very much, John, for your warm welcome. Um, 
I would like to start by sharing with you what an incredibly amazing feeling it is um, to be, to stand in front of you, to be in an institution of learning with the stature of MIT. I grew up in Somalia. My family went to Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, Kenya. It was unfathomable. And it still is unfathomable today if you are from any one of those countries or all of the other countries to be able to be a student at MIT. To get into MIT, you have to jump so many hurdles. You have to prove to the world that you belong to that teeny tiny group, that chosen minority that have made it. To be an educator, to be a professor, a teacher, you have the privilege of saying, I don't get to teach just anyone. I get to teach the world's best and brightest. And I have to start by telling you how much I appreciate that, how much I'm humbled by that. So thank you for having me, and thank you for granting me one hour of your time to discuss my book, Heretic, with you. Heretic, and the book before that, Nomad, and the book before that, Infidel, and the book before that, The Caged Virgin, it was all inspired by this big event that took place 14 years ago, 9-11-2001. I was only 30 years old, 31 years old, started my first job. A group of young men, 19 in total, attacked the United States of America in New York, in Washington, D.C., after the great symbols of what makes this country great, the economic symbols, the political symbols, and defense symbols. And that was done in the religion of my parents, at that time actually in my religion, in my faith. And that's 14 years ago. So for the for last 14 years, I've been trying to grapple with trying to answer the same question that many of you, and you know, as students, you really are young. I don't know where you were 14 years ago. I don't know how old you are 14 years ago. But being in my early 30s, being female, having been exposed to a free liberal society such as the Netherlands for at least a decade, and before that, having lived in unfree societies that don't have the opportunities that we have here, I struggle to answer the question, what is it that these 19 young men did? What, what, what do their actions have to do with my religion, my morality? And I can imagine if you belong to the religion of Islam every day, as atrocity after atrocity unfolds and the people who commit those atrocities claim the religion of Islam as their motivation, as their inspiration, as their tool of mobilization, that you ask yourselves, what is it that I have to do with it? What should I do? So 14 years ago, on the individual level, even though it seemed extremely difficult at the time, in a way, it was easier to look at what these people were saying, to check it off against what was the doctrine, the heart and soul of the faith that I grew up in, and to say, yeah, sure, what they've done and what my religion says, at least in, on a scriptural level, there is some consistency there. But what does it have to do with me? I can just like really, I went to the University of Leiden, I was working for a political party, the think tank of it. I could have chosen themes such as transport or social geography, subjects that have nothing to do with religion, society, politics. I didn't, I couldn't. <coughs> and. I went through a process of trying to figure out 
not only. The easy part was to figure out what it was that the 19 men did and what it had to do with my religion. The hard part was trying to figure out why these, you know, in my context, it was the Dutch elite, but the other European elites, the American elites, our political leaders, our academic leaders, our journalistic leaders, why they kept on insisting in the face of everything that we are seeing that it had nothing to do with Islam. And Heretic, the book, is a child of that. It is an answer, it's trying to answer the question, why? Why do we say the Islamic State is not Islamic, that Al-Qaeda is not Islamic, that Al-Shabaab, the country I was born in, Somalia, that that is not Islamic? I'm going to take a short poll. If you think that the Islamic State has something to do with the doctrine of Islam, please raise your hand. If it has anything to do with Al-Qaeda, please raise your hand. If it has anything to do with the people who are manifestly Muslim in the sense that they wear headscarves and are really good people and are at MIT and are contributing to society but are Muslim and that they have nothing to do with Al-Qaeda or ISIS, raise your hand. So as liberal, intelligent, rational societies, why is it impossible for us to distinguish between what is the doctrinaire versus what is what individual human beings do? So the central question in heretic is, I accept that the violent extremism and the non-violent extremism that feeds the violent extremism, that it all has to do with Islam if it is manifestly Muslim and if it's well argued. But then how can we tell the difference between Muslims? There are 1.5, maybe 1.6 billion Muslims, one-fifth of humanity. Is there any way of categorizing them that is intelligent and that can tell the difference between who we can ally with against those who are violent and those who inspire violence and those who don't and who want to get on with life? And I think there is a way. And the way to do that is by taking an interest in what the people we've come to call extremism say about themselves, about their objectives, about what inspires them. What is it that they take within this 14 and a half year, uh, 1,437, 38 years of doctrine and of civilization, of culture, of tradition, what is it that they take and that they use as a tool to inspire, to mobilize young people to their cause. Who are they? What should we call them? In Heretic, I've decided to call them the Medina Muslims because they start with the founder of Islam, Muhammad, and the foundational document, the Quran. And they pick very clearly and exclusively everything that happened after the emigration of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. The figure of Muhammad in Medina, he was a warrior, he was a lawmaker, he was a philanderer, he was a politician. He established an empire before he died and after he died, those who followed his example destroyed empires and took them over. And that lasted well into the 18th century. If you want to follow that example, you want to hark back to that glory, then you belong to the subset Medina. But opposing that group is what I have come to call in heretic, the modifiers. Individuals from within Islam who grew up in Muslim households like I did, with the Islamic tradition, who were saying there are things that Muhammad said and did, there are things in the Quran, 
and in this long tradition that we object to on ethical grounds, on moral grounds, on grounds of modernity. We cannot go back in history. We can only go forward. Therefore, even though we will continue to admire the figure of Muhammad, we will not follow him, we will not take him as a moral guide in the 21st century. And in between these two forces within Islam, the Medina Muslims and the modifiers or the reformers, is this large swathe of people who just want to go about their business. They don't want a debate or a dialogue. They don't want to waste time fighting this or the other. They're completely, they're just getting on with their lives. They call themselves Muslim. <coughs> and what they highlight in their daily, daily lives is the example of this figure, this icon, the Prophet Muhammad, but then in his years in Mecca. They say, we're all good people, you are good people, everybody is a good person, at least that's from, you know, that's where we start. We pray, we fast, we may not pray, we may not fast, it doesn't matter, but we just get on with that. So they emphasize the Mecca experience. But e e emphasizing the Mecca experience in your life means like my mother and my grandmother and my father that you don't really immunize, you don't inoculate your children against this lure of the Medina Muslims. And what the Medina Muslims do is they build on what the Mecca Muslims put forth, which is if you are a Muslim and you believe, you have to respect the Prophet Muhammad 100%, you have to obey him 100%, never question him, never question the Quran. So when you are a teenager growing up in a Mecca household and you're asking yourself, excuse my language, what the F is this life for? What is it all about? Why am I here? Eat, sleep, Reproduce, eat, sleep, reproduce, is that what we are, how are we different from animals? What's the point? What's the point? What's the point? The Medina Muslim is willing not only to give you a point, but a purpose. And not only a purpose, but the means to the purpose. And if the means to the purpose is something that's against your conscience, like take someone else's head off, in my case, as a 15-year-old, it was just, you know, your friendships with non-Muslims, give them a condition, either they become a Muslim or you end the friendship. So it can't start on that level, and it can take you to something much more serious. The Medina Muslim is not inhibited. He'll appeal to the heart and soul of the, of the doctrine of what Muhammad did in Medina. And the millions and millions and millions of Muslims, like my mother and my grandmother, who couldn't even read the Quran, they had no idea what Muhammad said, but who do believe and believe very strongly and fundamentally, and who say to their children, this is who we are, that's our identity, this is what we believe in. Muhammad and the Quran are perfect. You find yourself as a child of a Mecca Muslim struggling to answer those questions for yourself. Before the Arab Spring, I thought it was all over. I thought the Medina Muslims would win because there was no force balancing that. There was no one else appealing from within Islam to the impressionable young people. And if you look at the demographics of the Muslim world today, you will see that it is a young world. 80 maybe 70% are under the age of 30. So just imagine how young that population is. And that youth, that's not only seeking material things like jobs and gadgets and cars and you name it, but who are also seeking answers to moral and ethical questions are finding before them agents of Medina Islam. And the Medina Muslims are not only 
the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. It's not only Al-Qaeda. It's not only these renegade groups. There are also states. Saudi Arabia is one of them. That's the Sunni part. There is Iran. So it's, it's, it's an entire movement, governmental and non-governmental, that's out there to provide easy answers to one-fifth of humanity. Now I have seen that there is indeed, after the Arab spring, winter, as we call it, that there's this third force, the reformers, the modifiers, people from within who are struggling to give an answer to the same questions and who are saying, no, please do not go with the Medina Muslims. And the point of heretic is not to say that the United States of America or the free world will reform Islam. I don't think it's the job of the US to reform Islam. But if within Islam, a reformation defined as a transformation, that is an abrogation of Muhammad's conduct in Medina and the Quranic creed in Medina, if that is taking place, then it's in our interest to aid that. It's in our interest to review our partnerships and our alliances. If you have ever heard of the bloggers in Bangladesh or the bloggers in Saudi Arabia or the bloggers in any part of the Muslim world, very young, very well educated, who are arguing that the separation of religion from politics is something that they are willing to invest in, that they want their children, they want their children to grow up in a society that separates the two, and that those bloggers are attacked with meat cleavers and killed, and we're seeing these signs, or that a blogger like Raif Badawi in Saudi Arabia is thrown into prison, sentenced to a thousand lashes. This because of the clergyman in Saudi Arabia because he attacked them. Power is concentrated in their hands and they abuse that power. He attacked them and he has a following. And the response from the state is, throw him in prison. They wanted to kill him. There was some international, because we live in the time of you know, international, or rather, um, you know, communication technology revolution. We were able to agitate and world leaders were willing to step in and talk to the Saudi authorities and to say, this is wrong for you to do. So from the death penalty, he went to 1,000 lashes. From 1,000 lashes, he got 50. And maybe with the new king, he might face a death penalty again. That's the type. This is just to demonstrate, to illustrate to you the kind of struggle for freedom, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, the separation of religion from politics that 21st century contemporary Muslims have to go through to achieve what we take for granted here at MIT and in the rest of the United States of America. And now, I'm so happy to sit here, take your questions and yours too. Very well said. Um, my I have a few questions, but I, I, I want to start with um, the most difficult one first, I suppose. And that is, when I read Heretic and listening to you speak, your views seem to have moderated from a few years ago. Um, when you, for example, described uh, or said that violence is inherent in Islam, it's destructive, it's a destructive nihilistic cult of death, and so on. Um, do you, do you, have your views evolved over the years as you've become more exposed to different views, criticisms, and so on? 
So I think it's important to say, you know, what has evolved? Has the doctrine changed? Have the verses in the Quran changed? There are nihilistic death cultish verses in the Quran. There is the conduct of Muhammad in Medina um, that is manifestly violent and people are still inspired by it and the world is destabilized by it. Has that changed? No, but as I said in my brief remarks, what I'm seeing today is that if you look at the majority of Muslims, it's not only fanatics versus apathetics. There's this third group, and that's very interesting, and it's very exciting. And before the Arab Spring, I call them the heretics because that's what we are called. But before the Arab Spring, I saw individuals scattered over the planet, each having their own thoughts and grumbling about the tradition that they were raised in. But during this Arab Spring period, I'm seeing women organizing, gays organizing, people of science organizing. So I'm seeing an emerging group of young people that may or may not be organized. If you take a small country like Tunisia, they are organized. If you put that in a sort of worldwide global mat, they are not organized. We are not organized. We want change, but we don't know how to find one another. We don't know how to organize yet. We're struggling with all the obstacles. And it's not only obstacles from the Al Qaeda or ISIS person who says, if you don't believe what I believe in, I'll kill you. And so then I have to run around and raise money to protect myself. But it's also the states. So an example is Raif Badawi, whom I've just mentioned. If within Saudi Arabia, you have voices like his, and there are more, and I'm in contact with them, their complaint is, but there's this incredibly wealthy, powerful state that's against us. And so my views have modified because the evidence has changed. There are so many young people, educated, brilliant, brave, who are saying, we don't want to live like this. We want change. We want tolerance. We want equality between men and women. We don't want to kill our gays. But we have this terrible, oppressive, powerful government that's sitting on us. And every time we open our mouths, we get killed. And how can we outsmart them? And so my job, living in a free country, the most powerful, the freest country on the planet, is to say, well, in that case, let's find a way we can empower you, those who truly want to change. And some of them are Muslim. Some of them are clerics. Some of them are not Muslim. It doesn't matter. It's all about the fact that they seek change that is liberal and tolerant. It's about life and not about death. It's about the rule of law and not about arbitrariness and corruption and authoritarianism. I take that to be uh, an accurate assessment at some level. And, but I also wonder about others in many um, predominantly Muslim countries who are also protesting or fighting what they consider to be corrupt governments, governments that are aligned with the United States or governments that are in some way uh, repressive, uh, sometimes very harshly so, non-democratic and so on. But they really have chosen the path of, of jihad or of violent, uh, uh, of violence. Um, so is it about religion? Is this urge to protest, urge to change uh, the state, several states? Is it about religion or is it about uh, a long time uh, repression of social economic rights or even minimal economic growth, for, for example, among other possible causes. Again, I'll give you, and, and, and I do like talking about 
my mother, who's extremely pious, my grandmother, who's extremely pious, and who understand that human beings fight for a better life. There are millions and millions and millions of Muslims who are just like that. They may be pious. That's what we call religious. So there's this religious dimension to Islam. People pray five times a day. They want to go to the Hajj. They want to fast in the month of Ramadan. They want to get together because their religious identity brings them together and it creates cohesion and they look after one another. I don't have any trouble with that. But Islam is not just a religious narrative or a religious institution. It is also, and perhaps more strongly, a political system. And it's that political system that has a vision and a purpose for how humanity ought to live with one another. Who is bad? Who is good? Who is a believer? Who is an infidel? Establishing Sharia law, the place of women, the place of men, what should be done to gays and others. That political system that dictates every aspect of life that I think we all have problems with. Now, there are two approaches to it. There's the approach that says, do not dignify these people with the tradition of Islam. Since Islam is 14 centuries old or more, why give it to groups like ISIS? I think up to a point, that makes sense. But as a strategy, if that doesn't work, then I think maybe now it's time to say, don't dignify them by taking over the entire inheritance because those of us who don't want what they're doing are incapable of rejecting parts of that tradition or putting parts of that tradition to rest. That's my definition of a reformation. If an idea doesn't work and it doesn't work and it doesn't work, put it to rest. And you have, you've proposed that, that the United States and possibly some others uh, in the West particularly would, could play a role in helping reformers. I do. Do you want to elaborate on that a bit? Yes. I think what the, the big complaint, after 14 years ago when 9-11 happened, and I think the average American developed an interest for Islam and the Middle East and why were we attacked, who are they, why are they after us? If you read all of those publications, what you will see that keeps coming back is American foreign policy has been an ally to those dictators and authoritarian, whether they are a royal family or whether they are you know, a strong man. And that is true. And I think what a lot of us in 2001 up to now were saying was, we should stop, we should rethink this, we should reset this. We don't want to ally with a dictator like a Gaddafi or like a Saddam Hussein or you name it. Do you know of a democratic leader in there? We have some favorite dictators like the King of Jordan and uh, the King of Saudi Arabia, but if you, if you look at our policies, at least in the last 50 years, and within any of these countries, you are trying to fight for something that in value system is a win-win for those societies and for us. We've either overlooked it or we've aided the bad guys. And 9-11, that has come home to roost. And in rethinking that and in resetting that, we've decided to listen to the opposition, the local opposition. And here's what we found. We found movements like the Muslim Brotherhood. But the Muslim Brotherhood, like all the other Islamist organizations, 
even though they do not use violence immediately like Al-Qaeda or like ISIS, their vision for what society should look like is still oppressive. It violates the human rights of individuals, of women, of gays, of religious minorities. For one year in Egypt, we've seen a Muslim Brotherhood government. And immediately after, 40 million Egyptians went back to the streets and said, we want back a dictatorship. So for the United States, it's very tricky to say, you know, we don't want to support the dictator, the military dictator, but we also don't want to go with a movement like the Muslim Brotherhood. What do we do? And what I'm seeing again, and I repeat this, I say this in the book, I say, say to every audience is, we are seeing an emerging group of young people who do want a separation of religion from politics, who are preaching a narrative of tolerance to women, to gays, to religious minorities, to Jews, to the rest of the world. They want to live and let live. And they're there. We no longer have to go and impose what we believe in on them. There's this group of people who share these basic liberal ideas. We need to find them and empower them. I would say that's a little bit easier said than done. That's absolutely true. Uh, partly because I mean, there was a very interesting exchange in foreign affairs, actually, with Ian uh, leading off with an essay like this on this topic, and then McCants. Will McCants, uh, by coincidence, our next uh, Star Forum speaker, uh, responding. And one of the points he makes, I think, is is worth pondering, and that is that Two things. One is that any support from the United States to dissenters in these countries, among others, is, is a disadvantage for them and possibly a lethal disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, although I would, uh, this is not his point exactly, I would expand on it. Um, the idea, I think you mentioned that we had done this with um, Communism. What is the noise? <laughs> okay, let's turn off our phones. Um, the idea that uh, the supporting dissidents during the Soviet period mm -hmm. was uh, a decisive difference in ending the Cold War and bringing down uh, Soviet communism, I think, is a stretch. Uh, there were, it's one can hypothesize many, many different influences on the end of the Cold War. Uh, supporting uh, some dissidents may have been, um, you know, a positive thing, but it's hardly decisive in the end of the Soviet Union. So there's a question of effectiveness on the one hand and effectiveness of safety for the dissidents on the other. So let me first address, I've read Will's piece and I, please invite you to read A Problem from Heaven, in, uh, the last issue of Foreign Affairs. Well, number one, the statement that if the United States of America or any other Western country helps or is seen to help anyone from the inside who is making change, then they are rejected. I think that that is blatantly false. I think that that's what the establishment is trying to tell us. And here's some evidence for it. George W. Bush went into Iraq. He went into Afghanistan. And I have this scene. I was a member of parliament in the Netherlands. I was threatened by a jihadi. And I was being taken from hiding place to hiding place. And one of the hiding places I was taken to was a military base in Amsterdam. And I look out, nobody knows I'm there. I look out the window and I see a long line of women covered in hijabs standing. And then on the other side, men. And I say to one of the gentlemen who's protecting me, wow, what a hiding place to choose for me. What's going on? And they said, it's the Iraqi elections. And you had to see the thousands of Iraqi refugees living in the Netherlands 
who was so animated by the fact that they could take part in an election. They didn't have to. This is in November. No, it's in January. It's in January. It's extremely cold in the Netherlands. They are standing in the cold for hours and hours and hours just to vote. And you have seen those pictures. Any time anybody like a Wilmikans who sits behind a desk tells you that Arabs and Muslims are not interested in freedom, it's not true. Don't listen to the elites. Don't listen to the people at Brookings. Listen to the men and women, the young children who want that freedom. Another little bit today unfolding before our very eyes. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people come into Germany. They are screaming, Germany, Germany, Germany. Does it sound like they hate Germans? I bet you if in the US we opened an opportunity for Syrian refugees to come in, they would say USA, USA, USA. I bet you if the United States of America and the rest of the free world put their lot, their destiny, with those who are desperate for the women who are being raped, who are being sold into slavery, who the government of Saudi Arabia demands that every woman has a male guardian. If you can just lift that yoke off her, you think women are going to say, I hate America? No. But the people who think that they speak for them will tell you and will tell Will that they hate America. It depends on who you listen to. You're a gay guy, and you have to hide who you are because you're going to be thrown from a rooftop. And the world's superpower comes to be on your side. And you're going to say, I hate America? Really? It's just not true. But the narrative that we are told by our chosen partners and allies that if we help those people inside their communities who want freedom, that they will hate us makes us comfortable because it gives us the moral high ground we want to help, but they don't want our help, so we don't do anything. We promised to pull out of Iraq. We pulled out of Iraq, and there is ISIS. Islamic extremism was there before we pulled out of Iraq, but it gets an opportunity to conquer and to take over power because we created a vacuum. So let's not listen to the people that Will is listening to. Let's listen to the people on the street who are seeking our help, genuine help. So can we say that you're in favor of opening the gates to America with the Syrian refugees? I am in favor of that. Okay. But in, in, in order to open those gates, we have to have an exchange. And it has to be honest, and it has to be rational. If you are a Syrian today, and you are fleeing the oppression of Bashar al-Assad, authoritarianism, and that form, that level of obscene cruelty, and you don't want to go or stay with the Islamic State, which is putting on you doctrinal oppression, then welcome to America, but on condition that you understand what America is about. And that would be the exchange. Welcome, take ch advantage of all the opportunities that we can offer, but you are not going to oppress your daughters and your wives. You are not going to be intolerant to gays. You are, not, you are going to accept what we believe in, what has made America great. And there is no time, I have been a refugee, there is no time that an individual is more motivated to change his mind and his values than at the time when you're fleeing that type of disaster. And so it's not about opening borders and not opening borders. It's not about capacity and non-capacity. It's not about jobs. And not, I know that we are comfortable with those topics. It's about values. It's about clashing values. And anybody who's prepared to accept our values, we should set the doors wide open. 
Uh, I want to go to the audience in a moment, but I do want to give you uh, an opportunity to briefly tell us about the AHA Foundation, what you're doing on women's issues. Well, it's exactly what we've just been talking about. The AHA Foundation deals with a silent epidemic in our midst because we have immigrants who not only brought their values and their culture, um, but who are also confronted in the United States of America with the temptations for women, that they, these women, young women, want to go to school, they want to have boyfriends, they want to wear makeup, they want to wear fashionable clothes, and their families and communities are saying that's haram or forbidden. And some of these families are not only saying it, but they are conspiring to stop young women from going to school. They're sending them to the countries of origin. They're forcing them into marriage. They're taking away their freedoms, even though they are enjoying the freedoms of religion and conscience and all that. And so what the AHA Foundation tries to do is, well, since we are all here, it's not only about nurturing these, in my view, extremely misogynistic and extreme cultures, it's about the individual human being. It's not about group versus group. If the idea of America is that all individual human beings are born equal and are free, then we have to commit to that. And there are thousands, and that's only really the tip of the iceberg, of young women who are denied their basic rights, and they're the ones who come to us, and we want you to help in every which way you can. Many of them, in fact, are seeking scholarships. <laughs> Very good. So we will now open it up for some questions um, from you. And I would appreciate uh, if you would come down to the microphones uh, to ask your question. And we're going to begin over here. And if you would identify yourself, I think it would be helpful um, if you have affiliation with MIT and so on. Uh, but otherwise, um, please. Hi, um, my name is Nicole Masalam. I am a very active member of the Greater Boston Islamic Community, as well as a supporter of the MIT Islamic Community and Greater Student Body. I've been in this area for about two and a half years, and I just want to give a little background about myself so that you understand my question. Um, I've read your book, Infidel, and in reading that, it gave me a little insight in, into you. And I sensed that we are somewhat kindred spirits and that our experiences may be different, the, the isolated experiences themselves. But I grew up, when I was younger, homeless with my mother. And my mom would give me her food that we would get from a dumpster sometimes, or we would sleep in the back of a truck. I grew up with a stepfather and a father who were drug addicts, alcoholics, and abusive. So I grew up with abuse in the home. And I know how this can affect our outlook on life. And we search for answers. I think there is a key difference between you and I, though. And whereas this topic does touch on religion, please, I ask your forgiveness for bringing faith into this. But I pray that that difference between us will disappear. And that I sensed in you a searching, a hunger to connect with the higher power, with God, with Allah, with Jehovah, with Yahweh, whatever you want to call him. But I sensed that search in you. And I had it too. And that's what pulled me up and brought me to where I am today. And I'm very thankful for where I'm at because I have many friends, regardless of faith, regardless of political affiliations, are not here today, who fell victims to guns and violence, to drugs. So this is not a problem unique to any faith. It is not a problem unique to any geographical situation. So the, this is my concern with what you have to say. 
that you give an oversimplification of very complicated issues. It's not as easy as saying they hate us for our freedom because that's not it. I have a husband from Egypt. I've been to Egypt. I've seen what these people have to say about us. I work in the community. I've been privileged to, to help with the construction of the first Islamic women's shelter in the New England area. Can I ask a question quick? Is she giving a speech or is she giving a question? Just, just. I, I want the audience to understand. So basically what I'm coming to is, in your oversimplification, I think you're overlooking some very critical facts that Muslims who believe in the Prophet Muhammad and in everything that the Quran has to say, and as someone who is a convert, so I can compare different faiths, all faiths share bad backgrounds or evil people. But these are individuals who believe in the entirety of Islam, and these are the ones that I see in the forefront every day working to change ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the foreign policy that created them, the situation that created all of these bad things. How can you overlook these? How can you divide and classify individuals? Even with the CVE program, we're seeing this problem. You cannot classify people. They're trying to understand what radicalizes an individual, and they don't know. Go and talk to the experts, the professors, the researchers. They don't know. So how can you ignore this very critical piece of people like myself who work with law enforcement to make sure that our communities are safe, to build homeless shelters for women who are at risk? You know, there may be people that have questions, actually. You're dominating this. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So, that, so, how, so how does this piece figure into all of your data and tend to your conclusions? Okay, okay, listen, that's enough. That's enough, you've made your views now. We have a guess. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I'm really sorry about that. I, I'll keep my answer brief. Uh, you described how it is awful to grow up in and with, say, abusive culture, drugs, domestic violence. In a free society, we can debate that freely. Drugs, good or bad, how much of that do we allow? What is addiction? Which type of family culture allows for that? What do religions, faiths, et cetera, say about it? In the United States of America, I can start a debate or a discussion about Christianity and the way it deals with all of these issues. And any of you will take any kind of position. The same with Judaism, with people who have no faith, like atheism, with Buddhism, et cetera. There's only one faith that's the faith of my father and mother, the faith that I grew up in, that is so defensive as to say, whatever it is that we do within our tradition, it is and has to be someone else's fault. It has to be external. We have nothing to do with it. It's perfectly OK to, for us to have a discussion on whether Jesus Christ is relevant to inspire people who are homeless to get out of their situation or not. If you bring the Prophet Muhammad into the equation, you start to run into very defensive. Last night, I was at Harvard, Sam Harris and my friend, uh, my friend Sam Harris and my other friend Majid now as we're discussing that there's only one religious icon if you draw a stick figure and you call that Muhammad, it's only one group of people who will riot predictably. That doesn't mean all Muslims will riot, but a large enough group will riot to attract attention. That doesn't apply to the rest of humanity. 
And if in the religion of my father and mother, the religion I grew up with, we are committing so much violence, not only against people who don't believe in Islam, but within Islam. If you look at now the bloodshed between Sunnis and Shia, and the way that religion is brought into it, how can you just stand back and say religion has nothing to do with it? I'm so glad that your Egyptian husband was so wonderful to you and that he's helped you and lifted you up. But I want to bet you that's not because he is Egyptian or because he is Muslim. But what you share above all religions is humanity and compassion. And I, like you, should fight against any pollution of that compassion, human to human compassion, with such irrationalities as religion. Thank you. Okay, we'll go here because you were waiting. And then... Okay. Um... What's up? My name is Sisham. I'm a former grad student at the Media Lab. Um, can't believe I have to say this, but I'm very American. I'm more American than anybody else here. Like, <laughs> straight up. Um, I mean, thank you, thank you. That's what I'm talking about. OK. Um, but I do have to say that there was actually a lot of things that you said that did make sense to my rationality, in the sense that you know we should let in refugees. We should let people like really, really get to experience the American immigrant experience, you know, where we have freedom for people who are gay, people who, you know, like uh, we have freedom for people of all sexualities, all people, uh, we have people who are like both men, women, black, white, all these things, and including religion. Um, there is one thing, though, that you did say that really takes the wind out of the breath of, and I'm also a Muslim, by the way, um, that takes the breath out of away from a lot of the Muslims here, especially in the United States, who, like, from the fundamentally our religion really get these values and really mesh with the American values, because a lot of American values were based on a lot of Eastern values at the same time, so a lot of stuff really meshes. But there is something you say that like really takes the wind out of our breath. When you talk about like Mecca Muslims versus Medina Muslims, and you say that you know like this group of reformers is really trying to win over these Meccan Muslims, um, when you have these few things that you think are you know key to reform in Islam, you mentioned one of them being that we need to change our view of the Quran or change our view of the Prophet, um, peace be upon him. Um, and I can tell you for sure that that alienates like 98% of Meccan Muslims. And that's the same group that you're fighting for. Um, I'm wondering how important to your statement of reform mm -hmm. is the concept that the Quran has to change? And is it so important that it alienates all the Muslims that you're trying to help? Um, well, let me ask you a question before you leave the mic, because you brought the Mecca versus Medina versus Morify. If there's something within, if there's something that Muhammad did, like exhort you to be good to the orphans, do you think that's a good thing? Do you think you should be good to the orphans? Most definitely. I mean, I'm not saying you do it, but in attitude, it's inspiring. You yeah. can think of orphans if you're not an orphan. Sure. But if Muhammad also says, cut the head of the infidels, would you do it? Well. First of all, Muhammad no, doesn't say no cut well. the head of the But there's you know what? I'll, yes I'll no simple no answer, no. simple answer for you, okay? I'll give you a very simple answer for you, okay? Straight up, this is no, very no, much no. How, how it's very clear to I'm me. I'm not very going simple. to take that. If all Muhammad right. says cut the head of the infidels off, all right. it's 2015. Okay. You cut off people's heads, yes or no? Whoa, 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 so Muhammad whoa, whoa. says have, it, all, Allah says people. it, or the Relax. Quran says it. <laughs> yes or no? Okay. Yeah, Here, okay. This, this is this is to the MIT institution, and not only MIT, but this is this is what as institutions of education we are failing to do. We have brilliant young people coming from all over the world, and we are failing to give them this basic difference between what's right and wrong. If Yo, you don't uh, know the like, difference, if but you- like, he, First of all, what, he didn't say that. Say? He really didn't say that. He didn't say it got the head off the infidels. Second, if you want to say construe things that are say like, you know, like, oh, there's violence in the Quran and everything like wife, that, would you do I it? could say this. Would the Jedi it, are also very wife? violent people. You know what I mean? But they do fight for good. Um, this, would you do any of that? Would you I do what? All. Be very clear. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my exact response. You follow Muhammad's can hold me example accountable in everything he did. Yeah, well, I try to. Like, that's, I, I literally, really, really try to. That's um, disturbing. I, I mean, it's, 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 but I mean, if, but I do, I do invite you to come talk, because we are talking about this. Next. I would never, first of all, I don't have a wife, but I would love to have one. Um, second, like, yeah. 
Be careful. I would never beat her. 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 Like you have to understand. But like, but real quick, okay. we are inviting people to come to uh, to talk about this same topic. Um, you're totally welcome to come. Anybody else is How as well. How old are you? I'm um, 26. 26. I'll forgive you because of your youth. Next. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go over here. Uh, hi. Um, I'm so. I'm Wait a second. We're going to go between back and forth. So we're going to go over here for this show. Hi. Thanks for your remarks. My name is uh, Adrian Slazotrick, MIT grad student. Um, I have a question for you about your views on different movements within Islam in the West. One thing that I have found uh, personally to be both remarkable and disturbing is to see how uh, so many um, acts of violence, uh, the perpetrators of whom have invoked Islam as, uh, as their motivation, uh, like the, the uh, shooting of uh, the uh, uh, Charlie Hebdo staff, uh, you know, like uh, various attacks across Europe, right, from Europe, like you know, things here in, in the U.S. Um, how they have been perpetrated by people who actually grew up in liberal Western countries for some like of that all, gentleman. For, indeed, for some of all of their lives. And if you see some growth in, in reform movements in uh, traditionally you know, uh, majority Muslim countries, what, is it, you know, what are the dynamics that you see in the West that give rise to, to, to some people going that way? Uh, and what is it we can do you know, within the West, within the West, to counteract that. Thank you. Well, the gentleman I just had an exchange with who said he was very American, more American than the rest of us, um, but he, he started to get, you know, into some form of cognitive dissonance about what he would and wouldn't do if Muhammad were to ask of him. The interesting thing is that you are in the same room and you don't seem to communicate, or at least you, you seem to think you know one another well. Now, when I say you, I don't mean the two of you as individuals. I mean, in general, you think you know. Somebody arrives, dressed like I am, comes to class, leaves on time, does his homework, passes his exams. Therefore, you know, we all, all noses are facing in the same direction. And when that individual suddenly starts to behave in a different way, you say, oh, I thought I knew that guy. Uh, he was normal. He, wasn't he just that nice guy who was sitting next to me and who was very affable and social? And wasn't he even just like taking drugs? I mean, think of the younger Sanayev brother. We all think we know them. But what we are doing, even though we are living right next to one another, sitting right next to one another, is we have found in the West a way of avoiding the super sensitive, um, perhaps intimate, moral uh, discussions, moral conversations. Don't even take it to the level of a, a discussion. Just start with a conversation that it's not happening. So you invite some speaker from outside, like me, and you pose the question. And he is there, and he poses the question. And hopefully, we think, at least we hope, that this type of format then starts the conversation between all of you, and the conversation I'd like you to think about is, if you think of yourself as an American, more American than the rest of us, and you think of yourself as an American, then why can we not have an honest debate, especially if we want to welcome Muslims into our midst and think of them as fellow Americans? Why can we not have a situation where our fellow Muslim citizens are not treated to the same experience that we've put any other ideology, Christians, Jews, communists, you name it, any idea. Isn't, it, isn't this what America does, test every idea? Why exclude the, the Muslims? MIT does, but I'm not sure about the rest of America. You want to, it, I really yeah. think it does. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm a Christian here at MIT with, uh, you know, who's been blessed to have many wonderful Muslim friends. And um, what I've found is that, you know, as we pursue, you know, truth and pursue these things, the best, you know, context to do it in is friendship and grace. And so I would, I would like to ask you, have, do you think it would be of value to you to surround yourself with um, Muslims who are, you know, immersed in the, in the rich uh, classical Muslim tradition as you think about these ideas of reform, um, you know, to both help you gain a better hearing and also to maybe 
you know, show you maybe where you don't have the complete understanding. Um, and then also on top of that, um, I think like Kasham said, um, it would be, you know, an honor to have, you know, and a great, you know, experience to have someone like you join um, the Friday night dis Muslim discussion group, which I've, you know, enjoyed being a part of at times here at MIT, given you're so close. I do, but I have to come back to what I said to the other gentleman. Ultimately, people like me who are brought in, in forums like this is to help along the discussion, hopefully, and the conversation that takes place between you, because you go to school together, you live together, you belong to the same community. So when I travel around the US and around the world, my job is to sort of help that along. But yes, I do go to these conversations. And again, like I said, in the last couple of years, I am seeing very young, very verbal, he's not the only one, individuals who are born into Muslim households who are asking questions. And it's very brave to do so. It's, it's not brave at all to say, oh, the Prophet Muhammad is peace be upon him. He's a great guy, and I believe in following in his direction. The really controversial thing and the brave thing is to be a Muslim and to say, I do follow and I do understand some of what he did, and I'm inspired by what he did. But there are other things he said and did that really make me uncomfortable. That's the conversation you want to start. If you want to stop young people from going to the Islamic State, that's the conversation you want to start. I am happy to start it because I see it and I have protection. But if I'm a 14, 15, 16 year old, <laughs> I don't know if I can start that. Well, you, <clears throat> you talk about a clash of values, uh, but what kind of values are they that uh, kill hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq, leave a vacuum for ISIS to fill, they call uh, Muslims to jihad in Afghanistan that leads to uh, al-Qaeda and eventually to 9-11. They kill three million people in uh, Vietnam. Even Richard Dawkins agrees that secular ideologies have killed far more people over the last, last century than uh, religion has. So, so don't we need, uh, there's no guarantee that even if you get rid of religion and turn to atheism, that it's gonna lead to a more peaceful world. So don't we need to reform ourselves in our own uh, foreign policy and our own uh, domestic society before we can possibly even begin to talk about Muslims or anyone else reforming them? What I said to that lady earlier, uh, who is married to an Egyptian man, that what connects us more than anything else, more than whether you're an Egyptian or an American or this or the other, or whatever religion, it's, it's our humanity. Now, if you look at the array of philosophies that humanity has come up with since inception to now, what you see is that some philosophies are better than others and some philosophies are worse than others. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, the American Constitution and the tradition of, uh, what, America's 200, it's not even yet 240 years old, what we have is a system and a setting where you can stand here and we can all stand here and reflect on what we did for the last 10 years, the last 20 years, last 30 years, and come to the conclusion we made mistakes, we shouldn't have done this, and try and improve on it. What you get if you, uh, if you say that we're going to have only the Sharia philosophy or divine law in general, but in, in, the, in the subject of today, it's divi this Islamic divine law, is what you get is a static law that violates not only the rights of 10,000 or 20,000 people, but large swathes of humanity. If Islamic Sharia were to be implemented according to the wishes of ISIS, and ISIS is not, according to me, a product of US policy. ISIS is a product of Islam. It's the child, it is the heart and soul of Islam. I'm sorry, that's what it is. What we need, however, we're not going to agree because you're an American. We're not going to agree. What needs to what needs to happen to Islam, what needs to happen to Islam is for that third category of Muslims that I have spoken about to come and say, this is our heart and soul, how can we change it? How can we change it? You are so lucky to sit here and bash the United States of America and our president is not going to come after you, our secret service is not going to come. You can go home 
You can go to bed. You can show up about. You are free. You take it for granted. But you are. And you can criticize American foreign policy. And American foreign policy should be criticized. I criticize it all the time. But are you willing, do you have the courage to take on Islamic extremism? We're short on time, so you have to be. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a Boston resident. Um, you know, you've come up with some great labels, Mecca Muslims, Medina Muslims. You know, I think you need to look at American Muslims because I'm an American Muslim. I'm a Bostonian. Uh, so when you, um, and I just came back from Jerusalem. I studied at the Sholem Hartman Institute, one of the finest uh, Jewish institutions in the world, and I studied Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy, and there's a lot of violence in, in those texts too, right? So th there's violence all across texts. They need to be taken into context. So but here's my question to you. You want Islam uh, to be safe from extremism, yet you define Islam to be extremist. You set up a catch-22, right? In the past, you've said we're at war with Islam. And at wars, there are winners and losers, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, right? Uh, you said that we need to dis defeat Islam, period. Not radical Islam, all of Islam. And then you went on to say that once Islam is defeated, it could mutate into something positive. So as an American Muslim who wants to see changes to improve my faith, how can I look to you who has said all of my faith has to be defeated um, and say that you're legitimate in terms of what you're saying? Because you would rather not see my ideology or me exist in your own words. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I would say to you, say to you, you've got to snap out of this victim mentality You've got in the categories of Medina, Mecca, and Reformer, if you are sincere about reforming, recognizing what it is about Islam that inspires groups, not look like the Islamic State, Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, the Taliban. I mean, in the name of Islam, societies are being upset, people are being uprooted, economies are being destroyed, masses and masses of women are being raped. If you, for any reason, you think that all of that is not worth your attention, but that you're, going, you're worried about the image of Islam, then I, I think you've lost me as your audience. Because I care about, listen, let me finish, yeah. about human life. So if you are sincerely interested in acknowledging that there's something within Islamic doctrine that needs to change, and in the context of being an American Muslim, in other words, you're free, you're not in Bangladesh, you're not in Saudi Arabia, you're not in Sudan, Sharia law is not going to be subjected to you. You have the opportunity to not only highlight what those changes should be, but go about organizing and changing those, then you can. I know other American Muslims, like Zuhdi Jasser, who, ha who are doing exactly that, and I work with them, even though I'm no longer a believer. Now, on the, you said Islam needs to be defeated. The idea, no, that was your comment. Yes, yes. the idea, the idea, and, and this is, what the agents, you know, in every ideology, you have agents, you have resources, and you have people who go along. But the agents, the leaders, the idea that they are spreading is that not only do we need to believe in exactly the way they believe, but we have to submit to their world view. And so they have declared war on us. It doesn't matter if Who's they? I'm Muslim. I haven't declared war on you. The Medina Muslims, whom in, the, in my book, Heretic, I completely specify that category of Muslims. We have the brands like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, like Al-Shabaab. They have not only declared war on fellow Muslims for not believing exactly the way they believe, for not worshiping exactly the way they worship, but also for those of us who do not believe. And so in that type of conflict where they say, you have to die or you have to believe in the way I ought to believe. It's called war. And in an ideal situation, I think those of us who are defending life, those of us who are defending liberty, those of us who are defending the rule of law, better defeat them because they're all about death, about rape, and about subjugation. And you're welcome to come on our side. Thank you. But you know that's not who you talked about in your interview. 
<clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Brian All. I'm a member of the Board of Chaplains uh, here at MIT, representing the Baha'i Faith. Um, and I, I want to ask you, is there not a third possibility here? So you, you divide the Muslims into, you know, let's follow Muhammad because in, in every aspect because he's the good guy by definition. Medina. On the other hand, in the other hand, there's the say, well, let's follow Muhammad uh, some of the time because some other times, in some cases, what he did was reprehensible. Yeah. Maybe is there not a third possibility, and that is that let's uh, th that uh, the actions that he took in Medina, in particular becoming the soldier, yeah. right, was in fact defensive. Uh, at that point in time, the Muslim community was marked for extermination by the the uh, Meccan clan lords, and the you know the the uh, taking up of arms by M Muhammad and the Muslim community was was an act of self defense at that point in history so a third possibility which is another way of justifying a reformation which i agree with is to say i follow muhammad when the context is appropriate i don't imitate what he did in medina because that's not the context we're in that was then this is now so then you get into this, first of all, the statement, Muhammad only acted uh, and only waged defensive wars, that's half true. He did defensive, he waged defensive wars, but he waged offensive wars, and he waged more offensive wars than defensive wars. And so if you say, just from a strategic perspective, how can we, you know, sort of, as Muslims, not, uh, put ourselves in a position where we are arguing about the conduct of Muhammad, we are all for Muhammad, but we're only going to say defensive, defensive, defensive. Aside from it not being historically true, groups like ISIS, all the groups that we are facing that are causing this mayhem, they do not believe in defensive jihad. They're waging offensive jihad. Taking in the Yazidis and giving them the choice, convert or die, the Christians in Iraq, convert or die, taking their women as slaves, taking the war, destroying heritage. That's all offensive, and that's all in the example of the Prophet Muhammad. And so for some comfortable Muslim here in the US to say, I disagree with what ISIS does, and I want to defend the position of Muhammad, they're putting themselves cognitively, intellectually, morally, in a fix. And the only way for, them to, for us to help them out of that fix is to keep asking the question and turning up the dial called cognitive dissonance. Hi, uh, my name is Saeed. I am from Boston. I just want to, I'm actually kind of lost because it's been a uh, crazy evening. Uh, I just want to. There's always Google Maps. I, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you're, you're laughing and this is a very uh, serious issue. This is a difference between you and us, you know. And uh, I just want to actually to ask the uh, young folks that are here in MIT that I'm actually a Boston Public School teacher. And uh, before you just, uh, we do, you do a misleading here. I just wanted to ask you a question. How many of you guys through history that read uh, that Hitler killed uh, six million Jewish people? Can I, can I see hands? Right, so we all agree on that, right? Uh, how many of you guys know there's an organization called, in America, white organization called KKKK? That is, that believe uh, black people should not exist. Can I see hands? So I'm looking at this crowd right here. The only person that did not raise hand is Ayan. So, uh, all right. So, so, I mean, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just absorbing. I'm just absorbing. I'm, I'm just saying what I just saw, right? And this is like, this is straight up, right? We're keeping it real, right? So my, okay. all right, all right, all right. my question Look. is, my Look. question Look. is, I'm going to answer. Do you have you a know, question? Um, yes, have I a do question. have a question. Yeah, I do okay, have a question. Right now. We're my question is, time. do Hitler, do Hitler and KK represent all white people or, or Christians? Hitler does not represent all white people. The KKK do not represent all white people. The Prophet Muhammad does not represent all Muslim people. But, and here goes, everybody who believes in what Hitler said or did is inspired by his ideology, and we hold them responsible for that, morally or otherwise. 
everybody in the United States of America who is pro-KKK is held responsible for believing that. And if you believe in the Prophet Muhammad's moral conduct after Medina, then you are responsible for what you believe in and the outcome of those beliefs. I am a grad student here at MIT. Um, first, I'd just like to uh, thank you for who you are. Um, I read your book, Infidel, back in high school, and you served as a beautiful example of true moral courage and professionalism in this world. Uh, so personally, I'd like to thank you for being that example in my life. Um, my question is in regards to the, uh, the refugee issue currently. Um, I have no experience in the matter, so I'm going to defer to your judgment and your experience. I'd like to know what you see, um, your opinions on the view that these refugees sometimes will not uh, uh, adhere to, or not necessarily adhere, but open themselves up to the uh, moderate way of life in the Western world. And some people are uh, fear the uh, potential ramifications over long term where uh, societies based on these influx might become less moderate. So I'd like to know your opinion on that matter. Thank you very much. Um, I think that the refugee crisis, um, and it's not, it's not just refugees. We are talking about the Middle East, North Africa, South Asia blowing up. This is a human crisis. It's a humanitarian crisis. It's a civilizational crisis. And all along tonight, we've been talking about the crisis within Islam. But as that crisis unfolds and large swathes of humanity flee the consequences of that, what should Europe do? What, the sh what should the United States do? I think the morally right thing to do is to offer a refuge. That's what it means, a refuge. People who are fleeing, please do not allow, don't let, if you can help it, don't let fellow human beings drown. Don't watch as fellow human beings starve. Please don't let that happen. If you can help it, let them in. But as you do that and as we negotiate, and we knew this problem was going to happen years and years ago, and as we try to understand, we have seen over decades, we have an experience in Europe, over decades there's been a tension between those coming, those fleeing bad situations, and the host nations in Europe. There's been a cultural tension. And the European leadership has been unwilling to address that cultural and value tension. Given how big the numbers are now, and they will get bigger, and these tensions are not letting up, I think the honest thing to do and the open thing to do is not only allow people to come in, but to also address these tensions honestly. Like we said earlier in the evening, if you bring in with you a culture that is cruel to women, forced marriages, child marriages, all, all of these things that within you know, liberal societies we have deemed cruel, oppressive, let's have a negotiation about that. If you want to be one of us, Think of the people entering Germany now from Syria. If you want to be a part of German society, then you have to be open to what German values are and what German culture is about. There has to be an education in tolerance. And the obligation of the German government and society is to, with the greatest confidence in the world, disseminate and propagate what those values are. And it's not only Germany, it's the rest of Europe. And once this understanding is reached between the person who's seeking help and the society that's providing it, then what you're going to see is, it might sound a bit hard, but you're going to have a win-win situation for those people who want to enter into that marriage of wanting to live together. And those who don't, there has to be a humane repatriation system put in place. It's doable. Europe can afford it. Europe has the capacity. But Europe has lost confidence in what its values are. And that's the problem. 
Thank you. Okay, I'm afraid we just got time. We're officially out of time. So we're going to have two more questions. I'm sorry to cut the others off, but there it is. Okay, so you, please. Hi, my name is Ola. I work at a research center at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and my question is two-part, but I promise it's brief. So um, the first question was, you proposed a really interesting theoretical paradigm with three different groups of Muslims, uh, Mecca, Medina, and um, reformers. 44 yeah. Yeah, and then also the necessary conditions for reform in Islam. And so because we're at MIT, I have to ask this question. What consistent like empirical methods did you employ when you like supported that paradigm? Were they yeah. historical? Yeah. Were they qualitative self-reports with sociological or psychological methods? Like what were they um, economic? What sort of methods did you consistently Well, it, and because we're at MIT, and this is the kind of the wonderful discussion we can have before we get into all the sentimental stuff. Um, if you, so we've all, after 9-11, people like the 19 guys, let's start with 19. What is it that they left behind? Their works, their letters. And then we found bin Laden and his writings. Who inspired bin Laden? Al-Azam, Al-Zawahiri, other thinkers. All the way, it takes you to the Muslim Brotherhood because Al-Qaeda is a product of the Muslim Brotherhood. And so then you say, who are the Muslim Brotherhood? They were established in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna. What did Hassan al-Banna say? So you go to the original texts of all the intellectuals. Anybody who has an intellectual output and who has publicized it, and these are publications that are recognized everywhere. And you don't read what other people have said they said. You read the original works. And you go through it. And as you go through it, you're going to come up with these five things that have struck me. And it's not only the Sunni. We've come to call them extremists because we like to label things. But it's not only the Sunni extremist intellectuals. It's also the Shia extremist intellectuals that over and over again, absolutely nearly every sentence is referenced with the Quran and the Muhammad. They want to invite you to follow in the footsteps of Muhammad. Sometimes they get pushback. For instance, is it moral for us, uh, if we attack the infidel or if we attack the oppressor, for us to then kill women and children? In order to answer that question, each one of them will reference what in a situation like that the Prophet Muhammad did or did not do. So qualitatively, if you go all through their work, what's going to jump out at you are five key things. The references to the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. The insistence on life after death. Commanding right and forbidding wrong. The utopia that we have to establish Sharia law. And only then, and not only locally, not only in my household and my community, and my village and my town and my region, but worldwide. And then the means to do that, jihad. These are the five things that leap out at you. Read Sayyid al Qutb, Abdul Azam. Read them all. That's what comes up. And, and the all the way to Twitter and Facebook. So if you want to persuade you know, the non observing drug addict Muslim who is a misfit, the first thing you do is say, what is it? How, can, how did this man manage to persuade this guy to do what he wants him to do? And he starts talking to him about right and wrong. And the criterion for right and wrong, the Quran and Muhammad. So if you believe in that, then they start to manipulate you from there. So it is key, key. And I would invite the MIT community to qualitatively look at this thing. And what struck me as I was looking at this and analyzing them was asking myself, did other scholars analyze the same texts? Yes, they did. What jumps out at? other officials, American foreign policy. But American foreign policy starts to feature in these texts much, much later. If you read them in the late, I would say, 19th century, early 20th century, it's about a vision of what the world should look like if we went back to apply the recipe that Muhammad supposedly applied in these glorious years. Okay. The second part of my question, I know at the beginning of heretic, sorry. I was Is that allowed? Deep. Okay, but, but was that answer to your satisfaction? And thank you, by the way, for the question. It's no problem. Very um, and it's only because, so at the beginning of heretic, you bring up the Brandeis example. 
And you talk about the backlash you get from a lot of American Muslims, and I think we've sort of seen that. And then I know that um, a lot of American Muslim feminists have like reacted strongly, saying that you don't speak for them. So my question is sort of like, who is this for? Because it sounds like, in the absence of maybe like rigorous academic methods that are beyond anecdotal, and with statements like it's a nihilistic cult of death, like. Is this a good faith effort at a reform within a community, or is this a 21st century white man's burden? OK, again, because we're in MIT, if you are in the lab trying to work on the cure for Ebola, do you go around thinking, well, it might be for this group or that group. Am I going to experiment on this monkey or that monkey? Am I going to? No. You are just trying to struggle. Like we all, that's what you do in academia. That's what you are paid for, to try and figure out who is it that is using this particular religion as a tool for power? Why are they doing it? And what is it within the religion or otherwise that aids them to their success? From 9-11, we've been trying to struggle with, you know, how can we, how can we diminish this problem? And the strategy that our leaders and policymakers took, and I describe that in this in this magazine, my article, The Problem from Heaven, the conversations in Washington, DC, is, is this Islamic? Is it not Islamic? If it's Islamic, what the hell do we do? If it's not, what is it? You see that people at the end settle for a position that is not based on truth, but that is strategic. And the strategy is the people who are advising us that we're in conversation with, the Arabs, the Muslims are saying, please do not dignify the extremists or the people we've come to call extremists by calling them Islamic, because if you call them Islamic, you will empower them. If we adopt that position, the problem will diminish. So now 14 years down the road, the problem has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it's time to preview that position. And in order to help review, how can we review it? You're not thinking about, you know, when I write my book and when I give this interview, how do I come across? You're really thinking about how rigorous is this and what is the evidence for it? By saying Islam is a religion of peace for the last 14 years, the problem hasn't diminished. It has exploded. It's time to change strategies. Okay, so it's for American foreign policy. Okay, sorry. Just got I'm sorry, we have one more, uh, one more question and then we're gonna have to wrap. Uh, hello, um, my name is uh, Tariq and I'm at, uh, MIT at the Sloan School. Um, my question is with regards to the question of reformation. Um, it seems to me that if a reformation is to take place, it needs to capture or be able to capture something that is truthful, something that is of the essence of the faith. It can't be made up. It has to be something that's real and true in the Islamic tradition. In the same way as the Christian reformation captured, I think a modern Christian would say that captured the essence of Christianity, which is the message of love, and was able to get rid of some of the violence. If that is the case, if you accept that idea, what do you think is good about Islam? What is the essence, the truth, that has to be captured in order for this reformation to occur? So the reason why I make this distinction between Mecca, Medina, and the rest is because over and over again, every, every faith, every creed, every ideology has its figurehead. Um, we are told that there's this man, Muhammad, who lived back then, and this is his life. So you read the seerah, you read the Quran, you read the traditions. If you look at his activities and you analyze them, in the period in Mecca, he did say and do things that I think for people who want to stay within Islam or who don't want to give up their faith, they can find everything that we define as religion in the US. If it is social cohesion, if it is helping other people, if it's periods of meditation, it's all in there. The political part starts to come about in Medina. So the question then is, is it possible for good Muslims, Muslims who are not seeking to kill, annihilate, tyrannize, subjugate in the name of their religion, for them to form 
uh, fellowship around the Mecca period. And in doing so, so if you, I, 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 was, I lived in the Netherlands, and so you had different Protestant churches. There was the Dutch Reformed Church. There was the um, Anglican. There, there were so many different Protestant little groups. And so is it possible to form a fellowship around the Mecca period and in doing so manifestly reject the Medina period? I think that's possible because that's in human agency. That can be done. That can be allowed. What I've also seen is people leave Islam. People get into this fix, this cognitive dissonance that I, I discuss in Heretic and that we've talked about a little and that gentleman there displayed so well. And what then happens is a lot of them say, well, if, 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 this is, if this man is supposed to be my moral guide, then I don't want to follow him. And then they start to seek something else. And interestingly, right now what you see in Muslim communities and in the Muslim world is both forces, people who are saying, no Medina for me, but also no Islam for me. Um, I'm a Somali American. Can I ask a two second question? Okay. If you keep it to two seconds, because yes, okay. yes. Uh, my name is Abdurrahman Yusuf. I live in Boston over thirty six years. Um, my question is, Ayan, do you uh, engage in discussions with the Somali people uh, since you have written your four books? I think this is the fifth one or the fourth one, and if not. Are, are you open or have you been uh, invited? Because what I know is that uh, you are highly, highly demonized in the community. So I'm not sure uh, you know, if, that, if you're even able to do that, but I just wanted to ask the question. I'm, uh, and thank you for using the word demonized. And, <laughs> and for lack of a better word, I think it, yeah. I could say even worse things. Demonized, that's what they say, yeah. vilified. <laughs> And all, all of the above. But through the AHA Foundation, we are seeing more and more young Somali women who are faced with you know, a lot of what other American Muslim young women are faced with. And it's very basic. It's 5 PM. The family wants you to be home. I don't want to be home. I want to hang out. I'm 18 years old. I want to hang out with my fellow 18-year-old friends. I want to wear makeup. I want to go to school. They're forcing me into marriage. So we're seeing more of that now as the Somali community grows bigger. I'm in touch with, and maybe I shouldn't say this, um, but Somali skeptics. So these are Somalis who've decided they don't want to be Muslim anymore. From my perspective, you will understand that I obviously am a supporter of that. Um, you know how it is with just the way we look. I'm at the airport. There's a young woman there who works there. And she recognizes me as a Somali. And she says, hi, are you a Somali? And she speaks to me in Somali. And I speak to her in Somali. But there's no community, you know, Kamayan, you're one of us. We want to celebrate you. No, I haven't had an invitation like that. But if I do get, I'll show up. <laughs> Thank you. Have a nice. Yeah, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You've been a good audience.